to my website. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, or I guess good afternoon. It's it, I am all over the place timeline wise. Um, I know I usually have this show broadcast live from Fredericton, but today I am live from my brother's basement in Edmonton, Alberta, and our lovely guest Shalene is live from Halifax. So if this is your first time tuning in, this is the show Crazy Talk, um, where we talk about all things mental health related. We have a little bit of fun. We're a little bit sassy. We're a little bit out there, and it's going to be totally totally awesome. I'm your host, Lee Thomas. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, it's facebook.com slash Lee Thomas Speaks. And our wonderful guest today, um, just an incredible person. I'm so, so excited to have her on the show. Um, again, joining us live from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where it is apparently beautiful and snowy, is <laughs> Shalene Jones. Shalene is the former executive director of Peer Support Canada. And I just want to get this right, the current National Associate Director of Peer Support for the Canadian Mental Health Association. Did I get that right, Shaleen? <laughs> you nailed it, Lee. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, Shaleen, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. Yeah, thanks, Lee. It's super fun. And um, I am in cold, snowy Halifax this morning, although it's only 1230 my time. So I got like, my blanket on and trying to stay warm and our Cold yes, Jane Cozy on the show. I love it. I love it. This is like, you know, it's just it's just chill. It's like we're catching you, you know, Christmas morning, except, you know, it's two days before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and especially thank you for making time to join us, you know, during the holidays, which I know is just a chaotic time for everybody. Um, here I am, you know, forgetting time zones and forgetting days. And it's been, it's been a good time. Um, yeah, it's like we switch from being like in work mode and being like, you know, how much can I get done in this time zone? And then vacation hits, and we're like, you know, I'll get dressed at some point today, and it's yeah, it's such a need from everything. As soon as my my like automatic email replies go on, like as soon as it's like, oh well, they're getting an email saying I'm out of the office. I'm like, okay, my life is like, I'm gonna put my feet up. I'm gonna eat Rice Krispie squares for breakfast, and it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> That's totally a breakfast food. <laughs> I, I know. It's basically cereal. It is. Yeah. So, Shaleen, you are super, super involved with peer support within Canada. Hence, you know, all of your all of your amazing, wonderful work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about about why you got involved in peer support to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I uh, I started volunteering in the early 90s. I'm from Victoria, from B.C., and um, I had dealt with an eating disorder as a teenager and as a young person. And as I was going through my recovery process, um, I got involved with a community-based organization. And um, I you know, started volunteering there and kind of getting to know the people there who are, who are kind of like me, who had been through something and were like in recovery and fighting really hard to be in recovery. And it was such a beautiful community to be a part of. Um, and after I'd been there for a while and it was pretty, you know, pretty solid in my own recovery, there was an opportunity to to take this training called um, the Peer Project, which was like the everyone has that name, the Peer Project. But it was a train, a peer support training program um, for folks who had recovered from eating disorders to support other people. So this was back in like ninety four, I want to say. <coughs> so I thought it was really interesting, and signed up and and did this training and met like an amazing group of people. Um, who were being trained as well. And so that was kind of my first real taste of peer support. Um, and for me, it was just, it was completely transformative because it gave me a framework and some tools to take my own experience um, and my own experience through a recovery process um, and to use that to support others who were um, earlier in the recovery path than I currently was. Um, and I kind of felt like I could, I could, it was like peer support was like the flashlight that I could use to like guide someone forward in their own path. So, um, that was my first introduction to peer support and I was completely hooked. Um, I know that for me, um, being involved in a supportive community of folks who were like me, um, it helped me make sense of my recovery process. It provided me a context, um, it provided me with um, a way of being really honest with myself through my recovery, um, knowing that there's no judgment, there's just support and understanding, and that I could make mistakes. Um, but we were all committed to a recovery. So being part of that community was completely transformative for me. So that's kind of how I got my first um, connection to peer support. Um, and since then, I've been working in, in mental health and peer support. 
um, with community organizations um, pretty much since the 90s. Um, and I worked with uh, with Langhouse. I served as their executive director for a couple of years, which is a phenomenal youth-driven, uh, youth-based peer support organization here in Halifax. Um, so to me, um, peer support is, is so magical because it takes what had been a vulnerability or a liability even, um, you know, really what could have been a really distressing life event or, you know, experience and moves it from being a vulnerability to it being a strength. And I think as we move forward from, um, you know, not, not engaging folks in decision-making that affects their lives to engaging folks who have lived experience and recognizing the value that that experience brings, um, I think we really see more folks embracing peer support um, as it kind of lines up with other movements around um, really under valuing the unique experience that you have when you have lived through something. Yeah, because I, I was kind of thinking about that where, you know, you're talking about how being involved in peer support since the 90s, but it does seem like peer support for a lot of people, I don't want to say trendy in like a bad way, but it's something that a lot of people are talking about right now, right? Like peer support is something that a lot of organizations are are getting on board with who, you know, in, they might not have been like shunning peer support before, but they just weren't necessarily doing it or involved with it before so do you feel like like it's kind of like this is the time like this is peer support's <laughs> time to blossom like is is that the feeling that you have or is it just like oh, we've always really, been doing this no having done peer support in the 90s like no one was doing it and like it was just like it was so new then um and people were still you know clinicians that i worked with back then you know 20 years ago were still saying like do people recover like is this the thing like is this even possible and um, and people are we're much more recovery oriented um, in, in our, our healthcare systems and our thinking now. And I think as we've made progress with that perspective and seeing that people can and do recover and that we're not just an illness. Um, and as our demographics have changed, too, I, I think the peer support, like you said, is being more accepted and it's better understood about what it was. Um, and, you know, people are looking at how do we how do we tap into this resource um, and how do we um, organize it so that we can offer peer support to folks who, who could benefit from it in a way that's going to be safe and effective, um, not just for those who are receiving, you know, receiving the peer support, but those who are providing it too. Yeah, definitely. And you, so you touched on just at the beginning, you talked about how, you know, clinicians at the time were like, is recovery even possible? Is that a thing? Um, are there other kind of, I guess, misconceptions that you think still exist kind of around peer support? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, my background has been a lot around eating disorders peer support where there's so much stigma and so much, um, you know, it, there, there's so many shifts that are happening around seeing that folks who have that experience have agency and are able to make decisions for themselves. Um I'm sorry, I totally lost track of your question. No, 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 we're just talking about, like, about misconceptions around peer support, like kind of myths versus myth busting, I guess, around peer yeah, support. Yeah. yeah, so I think I think the, the big thing is that um, there's different types of peer support, and peer support kind of exists on a continuum. So um, if you and, you know, your neighbor are connecting around um, something you both struggle with over the back of the fence in your backyard. Like you're supporting each other and your peers in that experience of so like parenting or loss or whatever it is. Um, that's like a really informal type of peer support that we almost all, all do naturally where, you know, we say, oh, you know, I felt that way too. And I can understand and this is what I tried. And I think that's so much a part of our natural human experience where we're trying to connect with others. Um, and that's beautiful and valid and, and great. What we talk about about peer support is more of a kind of a capital P, capital S peer support. So it's more intentional. Um, it, it does happen organically all the time. Um, but this type of peer support that we talk about at Peer Support Canada is where you are intentionally connecting with another person, drawing upon your lived experience and focusing on helping that person um, move forward in their life However, much more focused on the person who you are supporting than yourself. Um, and it's using your experience as a as a tool to help that person. So you're you're able to connect around that and establish trust and 
provide some hope and it's really based rooted in your peer your your own experience but it's not about us it's not about you it's about the person that you're supporting so it's a bit more um structured and intentional that way mm -hmm. yeah I just, I also, so I keep going, like, you keep saying really interesting things, and I'm like, oh, I want to go back to this, I want to go back to this. Um, this isn't directly peer support related, this is more eating disorder related, which I know is a field that that both of us, through our experience, you know, are really interested in. Um, so you talked about individuals having having autonomy and being able to make choices, which I think is such an important philosophy and such an, like, it's such an important fact, um, including people who have mental health issues. One of the things I've been like, I've kind of developed my own thoughts around this, but I'd love to hear your thoughts is the idea that, you know, because individuals and like, so for instance, like I had bulimia where it's like very action based, you know, binging, purging. Um, how do you reconcile the idea of I'm an individual who's able to make choices versus I am choosing to have an eating disorder, which I know those things aren't the same, but sometimes it can, people have a hard time parsing that apart. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. I think, um, gosh, I, I, maybe I'm just quoting her name. I think Jenny Schaefer wrote a book called um, Goodbye Ad. And I, I think okay. that can be a really helpful approach to look at externalizing the eating disorder from like who we are as people. And when you can separate those two and think, you know, this is the this is the, the eating disorder's mindset or this is the eating disorder's voice from this is what I want. If you can tease those two apart, it's much easier to focus on self-determination of the individual separate from the eating disorder. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. Cause I do feel like, and this is kind of my own, my own personal like mm -hmm. thinking is that people, and we know that there are different degrees of stigma for different mental health issues. And it's not like in, in order to be like, Oh, well I face more stigma than you do. Like, it's not about <laughs> that at all, but we know that like people have a harder time. Um, yeah. Like members of the public sometimes have a harder time coming to terms with certain mental health issues. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel like people really feel a lot of stigma towards mental health issues where they feel as though there's an element of choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so so things like eating disorders and things, you know, any anytime where they feel like, oh, so this person is choosing to behave in this yeah. way. Stop doing um, that. Yeah, just, just stop doing that, <laughs> like as if yeah. it's that easy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing how like, with, you know, with eating disorders, and this is kind of like my pet area, um, I have such a connection to this world, but, there is so much blame and the belief that um, it's about vanity and um, it's, it's not, it's just like you want to do this thing. And so you're doing it and you should just step out of it. And we are beginning to understand how much of um, there's our play, not just with genetics, but like with hunger cues and gut, but gut bacteria, like it's such a complicated illness. Um, and that, you know, when you have all these things come together, they click and it's really challenging to just stop the behavior because you're you're getting so many um, biofeedback loops around it. Yeah, definitely. And like I oh, there's just we could we could talk about eating disorders all day. <laughs> because like, like, oh, and it, there is just so much to to dig into there because I think. And and again, not to not to play like the the hierarchy game with stigmas, but I do feel that there is a lot of stigma around eating disorders still, um, mm -hmm. and that stigma can come in a variety of forms. Like there's the stigma of like, oh well, it's just not that a big that big of a deal, or the stigma of like, oh well, you know that couldn't happen to my child, to my parent, to my sibling, because yeah. you know it's it doesn't affect very many people, or the idea that like everyone with an eating disorder looks and acts a certain way. Like there's so much stigma out there around eating yeah. disorders still. And it's such a specific area too, because you know, it's like it's like if with depression, you're like, oh well, you're only depressed if you look like this. And you're yeah. only depressed if you are staying in bed all day and crying. And that's like there are so many different faces of depression and present so many different ways. And it's the same with eating disorders. And like the vast majority of folks with eating disorders um aren't underweight and don't have anorexia. That's like, you know, not the most common, and yet that's what we see over and over again. Yeah. And all, yeah. a lot of our treatment modalities are based around this tiny portion. So, you know, it, it, I think we could talk about this like at length. Um, and it's the mental illness with the highest mortality rate and the funding for treatment is like, like many things you wait to stage four, like with all mental illnesses until you have any health that's available. So. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. 
That's which the end of my rant. <laughs> no, and, and and it doesn't have to be. Is all I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> so, in terms of kind of that that idea of people needing to be at stage four, like you know, they need to be at their absolute sickest. They need to like rock bottom or like whatever you want to call it like that whole idea that like you can get help when you're sicker um whereas you know it's unlikely that people would be like well you know we're gonna we're gonna wait till that leg is a little more broken before we fix it (laughs) um do you see peer support as kind of being being a tier where people can get help before they're at that really 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 sick stage it's like it's like the, the right the right care at the right time Mm-hmm. And you know, I think in this country where we really believe like psychiatry is like, that's where you should be going. You know, if you have a problem, like get thee to a psychiatrist or even a psychologist. And there's definitely like a hierarchy of, of treatment providers. But with peer support, uh, I think it's um, a, a modality that can be deployed in so many different ways. And for folks who um, are early, early in experiencing an onset of an illness, that's a great place for peer support for those who are in treatment, for those who have completed a treatment program and need additional support. So like at any time along the continuum is a good time to deploy peer support. So it's, it's a very versatile tool that we have. Yeah. And do you find, because I feel like so much of mental health and mental illness in general is that that feeling of aloneness, you know what I mean? Like that feeling of I'm the only person who feels this way and therefore, you know, I'm a monster kind of thing, or at least that was my own experience. And so I really mm. do feel like peer support kind of n- I, balances that out or negates that or whatever. Like it, it looks it right in the eye and says, you know, you're not alone. You're not the only person who's gone through this. Exactly. And I think it, you know, it's that magical quality of hope of being able to say, like, you know, I've been there and does get better. And, you know, I can, I can understand what you're going through. And I think that's, um, it's really, really powerful. And at the same time, um, I think I want to mention for many of us who have been through a recovery process and are vocal about it, or, you know, who are kind of out, um, there's always that chance to be like the poster child of mental health recovery. And like, oh, you're all better now. Like go on every TV show and like dredge up your soul so that we can understand things a bit more, um, which is, you know, important and also like incredible emotional work to do this real emotional labor. And I think that's why um, it's so essential to be trained to do peer support work. Um, you have to have innate qualities to be a good peer supporter. Um, you have to, you know, genuinely care about people and have great empathy and all this other qualities that we have. Um, but that's not enough to be a good peer supporter. You know, training that focuses on like establishing and maintaining really strong boundaries, um, protecting yourself, um, working through any traumas you have. Um, really important of self care and deep briefing and having someone else that you can get support from. Um, as well as all those, you know, communication skills and tools and, you know, knowing about resources available in your community and how to navigate things. Um, But peer support work is emotional labor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why when we're talking about intentional peer support, it's essential that um, that we we are we receive training, that we participate in specific training to equip us to do the job so that it's safe for us and it's safe for those that we're supporting. Yeah. And so that training, because I know like I I went to the, the National Conference on Peer Support two years ago um, when it was in Toronto. And I went with the intention like through through a company that I was working for at the time. And what we were really trying to find out is like, what does training for peer support look like? Because we wanted to like work on setting up peer supports with some of the organizations we worked with. And kind of the answer that I got from the conference is like it looks different in every in every province or if there's not a provincial peer support yeah. training strategy then in every in every organization um so if someone was like you know i want to get peer support training they can't you know just like when i teach mental health first aid one of the things i always say in mental health first aid is like this this training trains you to be a mental health first aider it does not train you to you know be a peer supporter um so if someone was looking for a peer support training, if they were like, you know, I think I think I do have those innate qualities to be a peer supporter. What do I do now? 
what yeah. what could they do? Who could they reach out to to find to find a training? Absolutely, call call us, call Peer Support Canada. Then go to our website. Um, coming soon, we're, we'll have an inventory of peer support training programs that are available across the country. It's very much patchwork style right now, where some provinces say this is the training we're going to have, and it's provincially funded. Um, in other provinces, there may be half a dozen groups who are offering training at different prices. So um, there's a lot of differences geographically across the country in terms of what you can get. Um, some peer support training is 90 hours and a practicum. Some is two, some are two days. So there's a huge variance across the table, across the board around what kind of training is out there. So um, I would say the Mental Health Commission of Canada had produced a report on the, the guidelines for training. So download that. It's free. You can get it from our website. Um, and when you're looking at a training program, are you looking to develop a training program? Um, that's like the, a really amazing resource to, to pull from. And then if you are with an organization, talk to other peer support organizations out there. Um, we have such great um, ideas and projects in this country, and we're not always so great at connecting to others and doing that knowledge exchange piece. So um, before you start from scratch, connect with some other groups who are who are in your field and uh, see if, if they have some, some tips or some things they can share back with you. So like scaling up training that already is there. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at accessing a peer support training program, um, some things to think about. Um, what is what will you get out of the training? Um, we really are, I really recommend training that gives you a chance to really develop and practice and deepen your skills as a peer supporter. So, um, you know, a classroom style peer support training where you're just, you know, there to absorb information um, may not equip you as well as if you're really practicing those skills and talking about some of the difficulties that come up with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I know yeah. there are. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I just uh, looking at looking at some of the some of the comments. Um, Lori Young, who I know is the the peer support specialist. I might not get her title perfectly right, but the peer support specialist for CMHA in New Brunswick. Um, so shout out to Lori. Hi, Lori. Um, Hi. Wanted to mention that New Brunswick does offer does offer a two week training, and I know a couple of people who have gone through that training, and they've said it's so good. Like yeah. it's, I know something peer support training is something that New Brunswick is really, really trying to implement um, and yeah. or not is, is implementing really, really yeah. trying to focus yeah. on, yeah. I guess. And yeah. so if you're in New Brunswick, you reach out to your local CMHA and, and find out more information about that training. And speaking yeah. of the, of the CMHA, um, so peer support Canada has partnered with CMHA, which is really, really cool. Do you want to tell us a bit about that partnership? Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting for us. It's, it's um, we just kind of announced it a couple days ago. So, um, back when I started, it, it, always a long rambling story, Lee. Right? I can't just answer a question short. No, I love it. I love it. And I'm so cold. Um, so when I started executive director with Peer Support Canada, um, in late 2016, um, I was really curious about, um, you know, what is the landscape now for peer support. Um, and I had most of my work had focused on um, Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, like, what is happening for the rest of Canada, and um, how do we how do we really grow peer support for the country? There's so many pockets of amazing work happening, like in New Brunswick uh, and other places across Canada. Um, and then there are places where there's nothing happening, no resources, no training. Like, you couldn't be a peer supporter if you wanted to, because it doesn't it's not a thing there. It's not it's not there's no structure for it. So we went back to our stakeholders and did a community consultation to hear what was needed to grow peer support, to make it more accessible for folks who may benefit from it, um, to to raise the profile and awareness of it and what it could do. Um, so we heard back from the community and we heard a lot about, you know, training and accreditation of training programs and places to online learning and like knowledge exchange and knowledge transfer and all these like awesome things. I'm like, yes, we need to do it all. This is what we need to do. Um, you know, advocating for increased funding and for, you know, just development in this area. Um, so we were really excited by that. And then we looked at our internal, our own organization and we're like 1.5 people. We're very small. Um, with, we have, and with no core government, government funding, um, we, really just kind of operate on a shoestring. So we, as we looked at these results and did some real soul searching with, you know, with the board level, um, 
we realize that by ourselves, we were not going to get there in the next couple of years. We would get there eventually, um, but we'd be needing to focus of most of our energies on sustainability of the organization and raising funds and like those structural pieces. Um, and so we started thinking about like, who else can we work with to really make this happen? And so CMHA appeared and, you know, they're in their branches are like everywhere across the country. They've got such a strong infrastructure and such a thorough reach across the country. And many of the branches have amazing peer support programs and peer support training, and they're doing the work on the ground um, and supporting peer supporters right now. But they also have the national reach that we really wanted to tap into. So they would be able to, um, kind of amplify our voice at tables around advocating for peer support and putting some of those needed structures in place to really grow peer support across the country. So, um, you know, the board, you know, looked, did some research and many, many conversations. And we thought this would be a great partnership and a great fit for us that we could work in collaboration with a strong national organization that does amazing work around policy and advocacy um, and really work together to grow peer support. So we're now a part of CMHA. Yeah, which is very so exciting. We still are peer support. Canada. Yay. <laughs> it's all 2018. So we all do. So, you know, our structure, our staff, myself and Lauren, our certification coordinator, um, our certified peer support mentors, and the certification committee that oversees every part of the process of certification. Um, all that remains intact. And the certification committee remains there to oversee the whole process. Um, and they really own the certification process, but we're sharing kind of back office operations and working really collaboratively now. So it's great. Oh, I'm so excited. And, and it's CMHA's 100th anniversary in 2018. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a great time. Let me tell, I'm really excited about all of it. Um, so I can't believe we're almost out of time, which is wild. This time just flies by. Um, so if someone is looking to kind of keep the conversation going around peer support, or if they're looking to, you know, get in touch with you and find out more information, how can people do that? Yeah, go to our brand new website. It's uh, peersupportcanada.ca. Um, it's new. It's like a week old. So check it out. Um, we'll sure have some updates as time moves on. So you can go there and you can access like all of our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, um, and our emails are there as well. So do check us out. And there's information there about the peer support certification process and what that entails. So yeah, check it out. All right, fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Shalene, just for, for being on the show, as well as just for all the work you do, because you are, you're making such a huge difference. And I'm just, oh. I'm, I feel, I feel, you know, not to get too, not to get too cheesy, but it is Christmas time. So I feel just really blessed to know you. So I'm really, I'm really glad that you were able to make it on the show. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I feel so honored to, to know you too. And I'm glad that our paths crossed when we were tweeting at a conference a few years yes. back. <laughs> And that's uh, Twitter friends, uh, Twitter friends to real friends. It's incredible. Um, so, and also thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, I know this has been a really, a really great show and I'm so glad that you were all a part of it. Special shout out to Lori Young for leaving some comments because we love getting comments. Um, in the meantime, it, we're going to, we're going to have a show, another crazy talk next week, next Saturday, always Saturdays, always at 1230 Atlantic time. Um, in the meantime, if you want to, see more mental health stuff. If you want to see more of my face, you can check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Lee Thomas speaks and be sure to check out crazy talk next week. Same time, same place. Um, we're going to be interviewing Carrie Gaskin from uh, Coverdale counseling and consulting. She's going to be talking about self care. So tune in next week. Thanks all of you so much and have a very happy holiday, everyone. All right. Take care. Bye.